Uh, hey, hey, um, where where have we been, Scott? It's been a bit. Yeah. I feel like the people listening to the show who might not follow our various social media accounts might yes. have questions as to why July was kind of a quiet month for us. <laughs> yeah, why this podcast that used to upload every single week on Tuesdays has been very sporadic in terms of uploads, both in the day when they're uploaded, uh, the day of the week, and also the frequency. Just the consistency-wise, we've been all over the place. That is a hundred percent my fault. Yeah, this this asshole here decided that he needed to do this shitty selfish thing and uh yeah. declare his love publicly for his yeah. wonderful partner in a big ceremony and uh just didn't care about the podcast. I had decided I didn't have a wife, but it would be cool to have a wife. And then so I spent the last year <laughs> trying to make that happen. And then in the last two months, as of this recording, all the wedding happened. And as the person who is largely in charge of editing and uploading the podcast, uh, that's me. I had a lot of other things on my plate, <laughs> if you can believe it. So I I just I apologize to to all of you who are regular listeners of the show for having a weird sporadic upload schedule the last couple months. I didn't want to say anything. I didn't want to publicly say that I was getting married until it already happened. But now it happened. And now you know why. You're back from your honeymoon. You did it, everything. I did it. Tristan was there. You were there. Yeah, I was there. We we were there. It was Wes Anderson themed. There was some pretty good cocktails. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot yeah. of dancing. Tons of dancing. Tons of dancing. That was like the number one thing for me. It was like... It was almost exclusively dancing from start to finish. Yeah. Yeah. And also just like got to see your wonderful new in-laws and got to meet your brother who's really cool and a bunch of your old friends. Did you get to meet Emily's dad? We've referenced Emily's dad on the podcast before. We had one interaction at the actual wedding where it was like, hey, it was while we were leaving doing the bubble thing. We were like, hey, you wanted to talk about the podcast with me. And he was like, that's right. But we didn't. Maybe we'll do it tomorrow. We did it at the, at the, the brunch, and then at the time. brunch we were too busy. It was too. It was kind of more of a communal thing, so like one and ones were not really happening. So leading up to the wedding, Emily's dad, who is a listener of our of our podcast, uh, an occasional one, not a not a he's he's not a fan per se, but he's he listens fan. occasionally. Fan in law, yeah. He the whole time leading up to the wedding, he was like, "Oh, is your is your buddy gonna be there with, from the podcast?" And I'm like, oh, Tristan, yeah, he's going to be there. And he's like, oh, I got to talk to him. I got to talk to him. And he, he would say that every time we, we would talk about the wedding and, <laughs> and everything. And the fact that it like didn't come to any sort of conclusion is so funny to me. <laughs> I think it's just because the ceremony was so dancing forward that there wasn't yeah. a lot of conversation time. That's fine. Through the language of dance. That's yeah. how you communicate. It was good because it was very good food. So I'm hoping that like, you know, they burned each other off, you know? Yeah. That's what I hope. I ate a lot, but I think like I lost like 15 pounds in just like Virginian just swamp sweat. Cause yeah. oh my God. <laughs> Can you imagine if we, we, Emily and I had talked about uh, having the wedding outdoors at some point. I'm so glad we didn't do that. That was the worst weather. Mm-hmm. Like it, it was sunny, but it was too sunny. I would say for it's a just wedding like, It was just a swamp like Virginia yeah. is a majority of the summer. But so it is, humid. I do enjoy it more than here where we get this wonderful combination of swamp, but also we have a gang violence problem where wasps basically now own the city and you cannot go outside without them harassing you constantly. Actual insect wasps or like the people wasps? Insect wasps. Okay. Like I I, 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 I imagined a gang of white like Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> Um, white Anglo-Saxon <laughs> yeah. presence. No, no, no. Like you walk down the street right now and like five of them will be chasing you. Mm-hmm. This is like the time of year where like you have to start putting traps out. Like I, I think any, any listeners in Ontario probably know that there's like a secret season and we don't talk about it because it seems like nobody wants to take wasp hell seriously. But between mm-hmm. summer and fall is wasp hell. It's this period where there's like, because of how they work, right? They breed really fast. Like they go through multiple yeah. generations in one season. So they're at their highest numbers oh, at the end of the summer. But then then as the summer starts to end, their food sources start to dry up and they're getting ready for hibernation and they're also they're starving desperate. because they don't have enough food for their population. So mm. they start getting really aggressive. Could I eat a person? I bet I could eat a person. Let me go see if I can eat that person. Well, they'll be like, that person is sweating. I want that sweat. Or that person I want that is sweat. eating food. I want that food. And yeah. I have less self-preservation to go and get it. So then like, they get really aggressive. And as mm-hmm. you know, wasps aren't like bees. Bees are chill. 
will. They just hang out and do their flower thing. Wasps yeah, will, these. they can sting without losing their stinger and dying. So they'll just like, they'll fuck you up. And also if they yeah. don't fuck you up, they can also just like headbutt you. It's 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 just like Whoa. the worst time to be outside. I didn't know about that. Oh my gosh. Headbutting wasps. And also another thing that people don't know about this part of Canada anyway, is that it gets probably like not as hot as Virginia, but like close and really humid. And so it's just like this gross, hot, yeah. sweaty mess where there's just these bugs that bug you constantly. Ah, uh, yeah. That's no fun. No. Um, another knock against wasps, as far as I understand, they don't make mead and bees do. Mm-hmm. I don't think bees make mead, but they make the honey that we use for mead. And so that's another thing against wasps. Don't like it. Don't like wasps yeah. for that reason. So that alone would make me take it seriously. But uh, this is a a podcast. I I've, we're, we're rusty. This is we haven't recorded in like a month. So We've like- not recorded in months. Like even though we haven't been uploading consistently, we did try to record a lot in advance, and we still are ahead of schedule because we only uploaded like a couple times and instead of our full schedule. Uh, again, my bad. The point is, Tristan and I have not actually ex- like sat down to record something in like at least a full month. The last time we met more, was in person. I feel so. This yep. is a podcast called It's Probably Not Aliens, where we debunk ancient astronaut, ancient aliens, UFO crankery. I feel like I'm we're turning into a generic conspiracy debunking show with sort of a lean towards history and a lean towards UFO and science fiction. Yeah. Stuff. And we're mainly going through the show Ancient Aliens and going through the random bits that they go through all the time. So oh and another thing too is while we were away the aliens are real. The go- government said aliens are real. So we'll probably have to cover that. While we were like in our sort of like period where we weren't releasing all the time, we had that episode where I talked about this thing that was happening. And then I was like, next month, mm-hmm. there's going to be a hearing about it. And then the hearing happened. And then the episode hadn't mm-hmm. been out yet. And I was like, ah, I know. That's my bad. Because everyone was like, hey, what do you think about this? It's probably not aliens. And I'm like, we did an episode about this. We recorded like a month and a half ago. We recorded it. We gotten so many emails from people giving us more information and more questions and stuff. We might have to do a follow up about the fact that the government said aliens are real. But that, again, apologies. We're back at it. We're back at it. We're doing mm-hmm. it. We're back in the swing of it. I'm back to editing and uploading every week. So... Thank you for hanging in there. Thank you for letting me have a little bit of happiness in my life for just a brief moment of time that involved lots of dancing and and drinking and eating food and having love uh, with friends. Just don't do it again. Don't get married ever again. (laughs) I promise I'm never going to get married again. I don't know if I can make that promise. I don't know what the future holds, but... You don't plan on it. I don't plan on ever getting married again because I love Emily so, 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 so so much. God forbid, if anything happens, I'm not going to grow up to be a lonely old hermit, all right? I might marry. I'm just saying. Oh my goodness. It's too soon to say. I'm not going to get married. Literally. I love Emily. Emily, don't get mad at Scott about this. Emily, don't get mad at me. We're going to cut all this out. Okay. Um, Uh, What are we talking about today, Tristan? So today we are going to India. We're kind of hearkening back to the Vamana episode, which I think was like our second episode or something like that. Vamanas were pretty up there, pretty early. We've talked about nuclear weapons as well. Part of that was a little bit in India. So we've been to India before, but we're going back. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. And we'll get into this a little bit, but Hindu mythology is ripe for ancient alien fuckery. So here's the claim today that there is, and it's, it is a city that exists today, a place called Dwarka or Dvakara or you know, the Sanskrit con- translations, whatever, mm-hmm. about 200 miles northwest archaeologists found evidence of settlements under the water. <gasps> in, Didn't in, we just do an Atlantis one? Yes, this is a, we are going through an episode of Ancient Aliens that's about aliens under the sea. Underwater ah. aliens. So there's going to be a bit of a nautical theme to the next few episodes. Okay. They found underwater evidence of an ancient civilization that include mm. walls, cobblestone streets, and evidence of a seaport. Scholars declare that these ruins were the remains of an ancient legendary city called Dwarf. Dwarka, which is kind of confusing mm. because Dwarka is a real city in the state it's of Gujarat today. But yeah. the mythical city that was led by the god Krishna himself. So okay. marine scientists found underwater in the a place called the Gulf of Kambat, mm-hmm. this city that they suspect from dating could be 9,000 years old. The oldest evidence of settled civilizations in India are about 5,000 years old. So this brings things all the way back. We're going to enter.
entering into Graham Cock territory where 9,000 years ago, you're getting into like the end of the last ice age. So the idea of like a city, a big civilization existing in 9,000 years ago. A whole civilization. Now, a little bit of clarification. Is this sort of like an Atlantis situation where it was a city on land that sunk? Or are they saying that people built a city underwater? According to myth... Okay. Krishna basically made this city and then pissed off another Indian god who struck it down with like arrows that crackled like lightning. And according to ancient astronaut mm. theorists, this obviously means they had like a laser gun battle with a UFO and it led to the city falling into the sea. This yep. is, Dwarka is very often referred to as Indian Atlantis or Hindu Atlantis. So gotcha. you're not far off the mark here. But yeah, according to mythical accounts, there's a king named Shiva who attacked Krishna in Dwarka and the explanations of how they fought sound like sci-fi warfare that led to the city sinking into the sea and of course shooting from the sky because the Hindu gods had like flying chariots and stuff like that. Obviously that's a UFO and you know that the description of, of their their craft are similar to descriptions of flying saucers mm-hmm. and that Krishna then departed the earth and the ocean consumed Dwarka. So they think that this sunken city found in the Strait of Kambat is the mythical city of Dwarka. Mm. That is the main claim, and that it That's is similar to other hidden cities from ancient times, like that found in Bimini, which we talked about, and those found in uh, Yonaguni, which is also mentioned in this episode, which we've also talked uh, about. We've talked about Yonaguni. And so it's part of a, a uh, uh, one of the genders of pseudo-archaeology, <laughs> which is ancient Atlantis candidates, I guess. There's a lot of myths about uh, an island sinking into the sea. Are there ones where like an island is like, and this one rose into the sky? I'm sure there must be. There probably is. Those are the two directions I can think of. I think um, Kevin Spacey did that in a movie with crystals. Mm, I think you're right. But that was in the water though. I don't think, did they? Superman lifted it into the sky. That I mean, Superman's if, an if alien. memory serves. Superman is an alien. All right, you got me there. The less we talk about that Superman movie, the better. Yeah. <laughs> For lots of reasons. Yeah. But that's the main claim that ancient aliens would say is that obviously this is a sign that Krishna, you know, sacred figure to millions of Hindus is of Mm -hmm. course an alien and uh, that he gave all of this sci-fi technology to the ancient Hindus 9,000 years ago. And then when he absconded off, he went to space rather than, you know, wherever it is gods go. Bye. That was the thing that I learned in Bible college or like that's a line of thought where like some people are like, there's a question of like, is God still all around us watching us or did he just make us and leave? That's like a genuine school of thought people have of just like, all right, I set things in motion. Bye. Next planet. Is God an abusive father or a deadbeat dad? (laughs) (laughs) We'll see. Let's find out. Discuss. Does he hate us or not care about us? Your choice. (laughs) So I decided to go back and like talk a little bit about Dwarka and understand Dwarka in the context yeah, of Hinduism. So ancient Hindu texts do talk about Dwarka. It is a like real place in Hinduism, but it's also a real place. It's supposed to be the dwelling of Lord Krishna, who is one of the most important gods in Hinduism. Mm-hmm. And in legend, Krishna founded the city of Dwarka on the Gujarat West Coast. Gujarat is a part of, it's one of the states in India. It's also its own language. If I remember correctly, a lot of the time, if an Indian person has the last name Patel, it's a, usually a sign that they're Gujarati. Oh, interesting. Don't quote me on that, but that was just something that an Indian friend of mine said. So it could just be a stereotype that I'm not aware of. <laughs> Fair enough. We know nothing. But Gujarat is like, you know, it has its own language. It's its own state. It's a distinct part of India. Mm -hmm. And the discovery of Dwarka in Ancient Aliens, they compared it to discovering the Holy Grail or the Ark of the Covenant. Things we've also Mm. made episodes about. Have we done it? We haven't done a Holy Grail episode yet, have we? No, we've not done a Holy Grail one. We have for sure done an Ark of the Mm -hmm. Covenant. You did that one. One. Yes. No, I did that one. Did you do that one? Yes. Yeah, I did that one. Okay, cool. We've done so many of these now. Any like Bible related one, I just like tap into like the bare minimum Bible college that I attended. And I'm like, oh, I think I can talk about that one for a bit. Just remembering like a Sunday school song and trying to translate it into notes. Mm hmm. What's the one about the God in the sycamore tree? Oh, why am I asking you? You don't know. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm like, you know the one about the guy who climbed the sycamore tree? You remember that Bible song? 
from Sunday I feel like school. I'm, I've almost become a one note creature for saying like, "Hey, I've never been to church. I was never raised yeah. in a religious household. I have never, never read the Bible. I've never even taken a single Sunday school class, etc., etc., etc." Anyway, people will know. So the origin of this whole thing of this whole claim that they found Dwarka in this bay comes from a controversial, to say the least, discovery that happened in December of the year 2000 by the National Institute of Ocean Technology, which is like a part of the Indian government. So in May of 2001, India's Union Minister for the Human Resources, Development, Science and Technology Division, his name was uh, Morley Manohar Joshi. Don't at me. My Indian names are not that great. Sounded good to me. But uh, they announced that the ruins of an ancient civilization had been discovered off the coast of Gujarat based on the data that they found on this December 2000 expedition. Mm -hmm. The site was discovered actually when they were looking for pollution studies using sonar and discovered a lot of regularly spaced geometric structures. This was probably about 20 kilometers or 12 miles off the Gujarati coast. And the site is probably about 94 kilometers or 58 miles in size and about 30 to 40 meters deep or about 98 to 131 feet deep. Wow. Okay. Is that a lot? I have so such a hard time with like depths. That feels like a lot. I went to a pool for the first time in like ages and like their deep end was eight feet. So it's deeper than a human being can dive. That's for sure. Yeah, that's pretty deep. Yeah. 30, 40 meters is like the size of like a four or five story building. All right. So you can put a, you can put a building in there. Yeah. In the announcement, Joshi also represented the site as being an urban development that predates the Indus Valley civilization, which makes it older than 5,000 years old because the Indus Valley civilization is like the earliest known civilization in India that we know about. It's very, mm-hmm. very old. Further descriptions of the site by Joshi describe it as containing dwellings, a granary, a bath, a citadel, and a drainage system. So like lots of different things people pointed out. And then on the 22nd of May that year, it was reported that Discovery had not been dated, and the Discovery resembles the Harappan civilization, which is about 4,000 years old. We'll get to that in a second. Also to mention is that the Indus civilization did have a port called Lothal, which was located at the head of the Gulf of Kambat. So this is all close to these very ancient civilizations as well. Gotcha. All right. It's all sort of in the same area. Mm -hmm. So this led to a lot of interest. Hey, is there like this super ancient civilization in this this bay? So Mm -hmm. let's to a follow-up investigation in November of 2001, which was Mm -hmm. when I turned 13 years old in November of 2001. And included dredging to recover artifacts and sonar scans to look for structures. It'll be really important to mention the dredging. All right. Among the artifacts, they found a piece of wood. They found pottery shards. They found weathered yes. stones that they interpreted to be hand tools or fossilized bones and teeth. The artifacts were then sent to the National Geophysical Research Institute in Hyperabad, India, and the cool. Burpal Sani Institute of Paleobotany in uh, Lucknow, also in India. I mean, like, of course, paleobotany is a thing, but I didn't, I never even like thought of that as its own sort of like wing of study. In Jurassic Park, Laura Dern's a paleobotanist. I know, but I always think of all of them as paleontologists. Ugh. Fake fan. Fake fan of Laura Dern. Laura Dern is now disappointed in you. That's the worst thing you could ever say. She will not 9-11 your spaceship anymore. (laughs) Oh boy. Anyways, the thing though is that they sent samples to get dated and both of these laboratories came back and showed that the wood that they uncovered there was Uh 9,500 years old. So that's where the the 9,000 year old date comes from. They found wood there. Was this wood that was worked on by people or was it just a tree fell at some point many, many years ago? Go. Good question. Moving on. Um, All right. Mm-hmm. They went for another investigation in 2002 and 2003, where they claimed to have found paleo channels flanked by regular and square basement like features. So a paleo what channel is, is the yeah. remnants of an old like river or creek or something like that. Like if you find like sort of a bed where a river used to be, that's a paleo channel. Mm. And then they found it flanked by regular square basement like features. These are like buildings, right? Or sure. at least what they think are buildings. So if that is true, this place flooded a long, long time ago and would fit the narrative that these are very ancient civilizations. Very old. To get the evidence that they had for this, they did dredging, which is basically where you take like a net and drag it along the bottom of the water and then pull it up and see what you get. Okay. Through that, they found what they called pottery shards. They found megaliths. They found wattle and daub remains and hearth materials, the kind of stuff that you find in a what used to be a fire pit. Oh, okay. 
So they found a lot of stuff scraping around the bottom mm-hmm. bottom of this bed here. They were sent to for dating at laboratories in Manipur University in Oxford, and the remains were composed of locally available clay, reed, husk, pottery pieces, and pieces of fresh water shell. They saw evidence of even partial burnings. This is all really interesting. This is like, oh, like there might actually be like a really civilization in this bay, which could change the entire way that we understand this stuff. Yeah. Burning underwater? How'd they do that? Mm-hmm. They then went back in 2003 and 2004 to do a sort of geological study of the area. And they did find right. that the sand ripples at the site might have implied that there were signs that there was not natural stuff, that there were like underlying structures under the sand. Mm. So that that all sounds like a pretty open and shut case that there's something going on here and is pretty intense. There's something, need I say, fishy <laughs> about this. Yeah. Did you say this was underwater or this was not it water, is underwater, this was yeah. dried up. Okay, 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 yeah, yeah. Then there's something fishy about this. Mm-hmm. Like fish in the water. Well, I will mention that the uh-huh. structures and artifacts that were discovered by NIOT are a source of contention. What? And we're going to get into the reason why a lot of these discoveries were, there's a lot of question marks about them. Okay. Specifically dating issues, trying to connect mm. things and also the way that they did well, things. So let, let, I'll get into a little bit. Dating issues is a thing for HR. So I don't know if that's mm-hmm. going to impact the evidence they found, but I'll, I'll follow you. Around. All right. Thank you. So the first major complaint that a lot of archaeologists have when looking at how this happened was the dredging. I mentioned dredging a few mm-hmm. times. That is not a good way of doing yeah. like underwater archaeology is a very difficult thing to do because as you mentioned on your honeymoon, you actually went to an archaeological site. So you would know I did. that uh, archaeology is a very meticulous and painstaking process where you can take years looking at yes. very small areas and understanding things from where they are and where they're placed and context is like almost more important than the artifact itself. Yeah, I didn't mention this on the actual podcast proper, but it was just before we were recording. But yeah, part of my honeymoon was going to Jamestown and like the the real one, not the fake not the fake one, the real one. And we got to see our archaeologists literally in the dirt digging up stuff. And it was just, it was really, really cool. One of the big questions that they're always asked is like, have you found any treasure? And the guy, uh, the archaeologist giving us a tour was like, people always ask about treasure. We found some gold rings here and there, but like the real treasure for archaeologists is finding trash because trash lets you know so much about people and like individual people in their society that like that is the thing that gets us excited. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. But anyway, it was fun to see them actively like digging up pieces of like pottery and like screening it. And it was was just really cool to see the whole process in action. It is a very like careful and meticulous process and where things are found and what context is super, super important. So you can imagine that if you get a lot of your information about how things worked by doing that, then dredging things up by just like dragging a net across the bottom of the water, not exactly the best way of doing it. Like when you do underwater archaeology, you need to have like trained people who not only are are trained archaeologists, but are also like scuba certified and like spending yes. hours working at the bottom of this water trying to meticulously deal with these things. It, well, and we talked about this. Our guide, who again is is an archaeologist, there was we was talking about this specific thing because they've never done any underwater archaeology at Jamestown, which but it's wild because so much of it is underwater now. But he was talking about, and I'm sure this is sort of where you were going with it, is like when things are underwater, it's not as easy to understand like the context around them as if if it was just underground because the water moves and changes and and things drift around so much more than if it was just buried Mm -hmm. on on dry land. So that's also another issue with it. It's basically its own entire subfield of archaeology and you have to be like an expert in just doing that. Yeah. So dredging is not exactly the best way of doing that. And so, for example, when you find artifacts under the water, you could not tie them directly to the site because not only do you not know where they came from or what what context, but also you're finding it in a bay, which is sort of like the end of like flowing water. So like it could have flown out from there. So unless you Mm -hmm. found it with certain things in a certain place, you don't really have a whole lot to, to go on. For example, the piece of wood that was turned out to be like from around 7500 BCE uh, yeah. could also have no significance at all, mostly because even though it was verified, dated by two different labs to that date, some archaeologists would point out that an ancient piece of wood does not imply an ancient civilization because you don't need people for wood, you need trees. Right. <laughs> that was that was the sort of thing I was questioning earlier. Is like, it could just be a tree fell 
or a piece of a tree fell into some water, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago and then drifted onto a thing that looked like a civilization. That does not mean that the two are linked in any capacity. There's also the fact that this uh, this is in the Arabian Sea. And 20,000 years ago, the Arabian Sea was, it was during the Ice Age, and the Arabian Sea was 100 meters or 330 feet lower than its current level, which means that mm. the part where they were dredging up was not underwater at that point and was likely, like, when the sea levels rose to make the Arabian Sea, it submerged entire forests. So there are like the remains of like trees and stuff down there. Yeah, just flooded a forest. Yeah, makes sense. So the main issue with dredging is that, yeah, you can't really understand the context of the object, which makes it harder to understand or or say definitively what is there. Secondly, there's disputing of the fact that a lot of these artifacts are actually man-made. A lot of them seem to just be stones of natural origin. Like they'll take like what looks Mm. like a funny looking rock and say, hey, this looks like a hand tool. And it's like, it could also just be a rock. Yes. I went to one archaeology tour in my life just now. Guy who's been to one one archaeology tour. Now I'm going to pretend like I'm an expert because I was told all this stuff. But like, Mm -hmm. that is a thing where like, People ask, like, how do you know what's important and what's just a rock? And I mean, number one, it takes so much study to understand anything in a keen eye for things. But more than that, there is actual like testing and verifying that you can do on things. And it's a very rigorous process. Mm -hmm. It's very cool to see. Look, I'll stop talking about it, but highly recommend if anyone has a chance to like go to an actual legitimate archaeology, like active archaeological site. Super fascinating. So Mm -hmm. cool to see history in the making. Especially because they're always fighting, um, like people going and seeing it are like, that's the way that they make the money so they can keep doing the work they're doing. So Something that we always talk about on this podcast is like how tourism can sometimes ruin um, important sites. And I was going to ask the guide if there was a balance between like doing these tours where like, you're right, it's a big part of like what can keep funding the archaeology to happen versus like making sure that no one ruins anything or steals anything and things like that. And I'm sure they've got, at least at some sites, they've probably got a a lock on things, but I never could ask because he was always talking to someone else, and I was like, eh, "I gotta go. Never mind. Bye." I feel like uh, the the actual Jamestown site is probably not one of the victims of over tourism. That's true. It's it's probably not. It's not because they got the fake Jamestown like a mile away, and that one's so much cooler. It's got people in costume. I mean, I didn't actually go. I went to the the cool, the better one, the you went real to hipster one. Jamestown. Yeah, the one that was there first. Yeah, yeah. But if you do go to like an archaeological site, sometimes you are by going there helping fund the actual work they do because a lot of archaeological work is it's fairly expensive and is reliant on grants and grants are not exactly the most reliable sources of income so Mm -hmm. making a little bit of scratch by going there does help keep the science going yeah So the other thing is that they found at the bottom of this thing, they found shards of pottery. And some imply that it looks like it's probably handmade, wheel-turned pottery because the shards have simple rims and small incised lines. All the pottery fragments found, though, are all really small. Mm. They're either small or miniature. It's like extremely small to the point where like they're having trouble discerning shards of pottery from like natural pieces of clay. Mm. Yeah, that's difficult. Mm -hmm. It's... I don't want to keep talking about Jamestown, so I won't. But that was also a thing that they talked. About. Sometimes it's hard to tell, like what is what is a what is a piece of clay and what is a very 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 small piece of pottery. Yeah, like what's a thing that's actually been worked on by human hands and what is just like a natural piece of rock. Yeah, yeah. And so a lot of them turned out to just be like verified to just be like stone or sure or clay clay. And also there's no real uh, proof that it's connected to the wood in any way. So we don't know if those came from this, even if they are real, if they're from the same civilization. The small size also raises the possibility that the real shards have been transported from elsewhere. Like if they've been broken up that much, then they might have been brought there from somewhere else, like say the tidal currents or like, you know, Mm -hmm. flowing down from the rivers. Mm -hmm. Because if the pottery is genuine, when looking at it, there actually is a lot of similarities to the Harappan civilization, which is nearby, which is also like a very ancient, civilization. So this could be shards from the Harappan civilization that have flown out to into the bay and sort of settled there. Yeah. And then over the years, they've worn down to be like these little bits. Yeah. Again, that's the trouble with like underwater archaeology is like the water does not stay still. It, it just moves. keeps going and it, it keeps moving. It keeps wearing things down. It keeps shifting things around. Mm-hmm. It's hard. Yep. 
The other thing that also makes doing archaeology and like dating things difficult Mm -hmm. in this place and also is probably indicative that if Duarca was here, there would not be much evidence of there being buildings anymore. Because Mm -hmm. if anyone knows anything about the Gulf of Combat is that it was formed by a major rift that resulted in the downsliding of the Combat region because the Bay of Combat and the entire region around it is extremely tectonically active. And there are several faults in the Gulf and regularly earthquakes occur in this region, which means that any like ancient building there would have likely have crumbled or been subsumed by the earthquakes over a period. Like if you think about it, any place that's Uh going to have like lots of earthquake activity, any buildings that are there that are 9,000 years old are not going to be around. No, (laughs) no, definitely not. Did you know there's only one wall of one building from the original Jamestown settlement that still stands? I'm still talking about Jamestown. <laughs> this is the podcast episode about Jamestown, about Jamestown and the, the mythological city of Dwarka. If there are ancient alien theories about Jamestown, we'll which, get there. There well, probably I'll will be. be there. There probably will be. There is there's an ancient there. aliens thing about everything. Mm-hmm. But the other thing, too, is that because of regular tectonic activity, it also means that there's a lot of stone moving around and that the, the stratification of stone is going to be all over the place, right? Which means that mm-hmm. it's hard to date things. And it's not a stable enough context to reliably date things there to be old enough for those things. Because, like, mm-hmm. usually you do that based on, like, the stone around it and stuff like that. But if the stone is always shifting and moving, it's hard to... It's always like, changing. Yeah. yeah. And also, there are some pretty strong currents in this gulf, which means that stuff is being moved around a lot. And also, it means that a lot. there's not a lot of stratification. Like things don't really have a lot of time to settle down they to settle. get the layers that you need to really study it properly and give things a proper dating. Yeah, always on the move. Yeah. And of course, there's another complaint about the dredging, which is that basically it just grabs everything, which means that on top of it being like taken out of context, you also can't see what stratus it was on or how deep it was or anything like that because you just drugged it all up from the ground. You just mixed it all up by dragging it around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that has not stopped Dwarka from becoming a famous part of internet folklore. And on the internet, there have been circles trying to prove there's an ancient Ice Age civilization, i.e. Gramcock, that latch on to Dwarka as one of the candidates and these discoveries as one of the cases for it. The biggest group is a, is a group I talked about in our old Vimanas episode, which are Hindu nationalists. This is a group of people who have an ideal of India being a essentially all Hindu state and having a sort of like focus national identity around Hinduism. Mm -hmm. They've speculated that Lord Krishna had the city and it's the oldest on earth and might be up to 32,000 years old. If you go online and look up for pictures of Dwarka, you're going to find these photos and I shared a few with you and they're basically like Uh, obvious fakes. You know I've already right-clicked save as these photos. Yeah, just to paint everyone a picture of these what are extremely fake photos. I mean, like, I'm sure the photos might be real, like that they're actual photographs, but what they're depicting is so clearly fake. There's like these like big archways that are like designed out of like with curves and, and cool like architecture that looks like it's out of Aquaman. There's like big staircases, like very obvious staircase, grand staircases. And then the most obvious one to me that's like, no way that's real, is like a full intact pristine statue of a lion Mm -hmm. with a ball. I don't know if the ball represents anything. I like to just think he's having a fun time playing with a little ball. (laughs) But all of these things for being as like old or however as they people might claim like and underwater this whole time, like they look so good. Mm -hmm. Impressively, some would say Suspiciously suspiciously, suspiciously good. Yeah. 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 But the thing is that, and this is a thing that will probably come up over and over again on this show, that pseudo-archaeology and nationalism have a very entwined history. We talked about it when we talked about how in Germany in the 1930s under the Nazi regime, there was all this effort to use pseudo-archaeology to prove the existence of this like ancient Teutonic civilization that they could draw mm-hmm. their origins from. In Japan, there's been this attempt to, by some pseudo-archaeologists, to establish a history that gives them less cultural influence from China and more of like their own identity. 
But like mm. every country, there is like pseudo archaeology to either make their civilization look more old or more advanced or more original, like mm. less inspired by people that they might have issues with today in order to justify that their people are the best people and their civilization is ancient and cool and does all sorts of uh, impressive stuff. And unfortunately, this is used by Hindu nationalists. Dwarka is part of this desire to turn India into a Hindu monoculture, which is rough because India is a extremely diverse country with multiple different ethnic and religious groups. It is the home of three of the world's major religions, Mm -hmm. or I should say two of the world's major religions, but there are three religions that like, like Hinduism, India, Sikhism, India and Pakistan, but also India, Jainism, India, Buddhism has its origins in India. And these are all still significant parts of the population. Furthermore, uh, and this is very often how it's used, Hindu national nationalism is very often used because India has a very large Muslim minority and Muslims Mm. are targeted for extreme discrimination by Hindu nationalists, including the current Hindu nationalist prime minister, Nahindra Modi. And so in Indian history, one of the things you have to like notice is like one of the big forces of Indian history and the development of like Indian culture and Indian uh, power is the Mughal empire. The Mughal empire Mm. was ruled by Muslims. It was made by a Muslim invasion into to India uh, several hundred years ago. And a lot of Hindu nationalism has been trying to undo that and sort of try to write out the contributions of Muslims to Indian history and um, and like, you know, the culture of India. And mm-hmm. it has led to things like massacres of oh, Muslims no. and like discrimination against Muslims and like a really, really hard time for Muslim people in a country yeah. where if you know much about the history of India, especially with their neighbor Pakistan, there is like a lot of tension based on religion and also due Mm. to the history of colonialism and all that kind of stuff. So this gets dragged up kind of like Vimanas, kind of like Brahma weapons into that discourse to try and Mm. build this fictional, hyper-advanced Hindu civilization that was perfect and great and awesome before the Muslims showed up and ruined everything. It's not good. That sucks. And it paints over Dwarka, or probably more commonly called Dvaraka, which is a sacred city in both the literature of Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism. It's part of something called the Saptapuri, which are the seven sacred cities of Hinduism. And there's like this description of it in the Bhagavata Purana, Mm -hmm. which shows it as this like really important city with like over 900,000 palaces and constructed of crystal and silver and like decorated with huge emeralds and like what I'm trying to say is the reason why ancient aliens latches on to a lot of Hindu mythology is because Hindu mythology Mm -hmm. is metal as fuck I think is the way to describe it it's pretty rad. Everything is big and epic and things are around for like, there's over 900,000. These people fought for 2 million years. And like, it's everything's big. It's, everything's yeah. big and bold and powerful. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I dig it. I get it. It's cool. But you can also imagine that then if you're trying to retroactively look in the historical record to prove that aliens visited, you can draw upon Hindu mythology, which has a lot of historical context and development. And as we kind of talked about, mm. when we had Avon on our show, has has a lot of local contextual understandings that are important for understanding all of it and just mm-hmm. says, nah, this is aliens, bah. And yeah, takes it away. Just let the cool stuff be cool. Just let the cool myths be cool myths, mm-hmm. you know? Just let it just let that's it's so much cooler that way. Yeah. Dwarka today is a real city or a municipality, I should say. And it is currently its major businesses as a sign of pilgrimage because people of all these religions come here to do pilgrimage because in their religion, they believe that this was a like sacred place for one of the most important gods in their extremely God heavy pantheon. So it's a big deal. Yeah. And it was also considered historically the first capital of Gujarat. So it's also important to the people of the state of Gujarat as well. So it's. Yeah. It's a big old thing. It's important. Yeah. But that is Dwarka. It's not Atlantis. It's not Atlantis. It is a real city that has been mythologized because it is important to a very, very large religion who also just should also mention, because it's just too close in time, that India uh, just landed a probe on the moon and they have a rover going around the moon as we speak. Oh. So India, like just two days ago, became the fourth country to land something on the moon. That's cool. 
I hope the moon is doing okay. Seems to be all right. I haven't heard from the moon in a while. You'll be hearing about it a lot more in the years to come. Yay. Because, um, yeah. Because of why? Oh, America's going there next year and like... Uh, it's going to crash on us like on Zelda? Nah. Just America's going there next year and everybody who wants to go to Mars is going to have to put a base on the moon to do so first. And so everybody's mm. trying to get back to the moon to try and build stuff there. Everyone's going to do Xenon Z3 and by where every, they have yeah. the moon base. By everyone, I mean the United States, China, India, and maybe Europe. I don't know. Cool. Either way, that's this podcast. If you want to... We did it. Yeah. We're back. We did it. We did the podcast. We did it. That's we, it. If We're back, baby. We're back. If you want to hear more about our, our stuff and get more updates about why episodes... No episodes will ever be late again. I make that promise here and right now. I don't. I shouldn't say that, um, but I'm going to. But in case there is a, an issue, uh, we, we don't tend plan to on having any out. episodes be late ever again. We tend to post on X.com sometimes about uh, it. Is that the new? That's what I'm supposed to say now. We're, we're going to post on X. X. The, yeah, we're going to we're going to X social. X. We're going to X each other. We're going to on... we're going we're gonna to post an X on mm-hmm. there. And our handle is at Probs Not Aliens. Yeah, and I should also announce I haven't done anything with it yet, but Probs Not Aliens does have a blue sky now. Oh, nice. So should we do a threads as well? I don't know about social media threads anymore. Is dead. It's too Thread, confusing. Threads already died because all threads it was is dead? was it was like if you took Twitter and reduced it to just like Wendy's trying to be snarky, and that's what threads turned into. It's just, oh, it's brands, just brands talking to each other. Gotcha. All right. Well, we're a brand. But that's okay. Uh, Scott. Yeah, hi. If I wanted to learn what it was like to play an old Barbie video game with you and Emily, where would I go? <gasps> my wife? You mean my wife, Emily? My Your wife? My wife, Emily? Yep. If you want to see me and my wife, Emily, who is my wife, my by wife. the way. My wife. <laughs> that's the first time I've done that. That's the and first time on, you've done a legitimate on, my wife? Oh my it's goodness. It's on microphone. You made internet man. history. <laughs> There you go, everybody. (laughs) Emily and I played an old Barbie video game from her childhood, and it was very fun. I had such a fun time with that video. It kind of flopped a little bit, but the editing is really good, and we had a good time. So if you want to check it out, please do. The best video for your two, like, chemistry, it's the one where you guys make a bunch of weird sandwiches together. We make Scooby-Doo sandwiches. That was a good one, too. But anyway, all of those videos are up on my YouTube channel, NerdSync, which is Mm -hmm. N-E-R-D-S-Y-N-C. I make a bunch of videos about cartoons and comics and goofy stuff. I have a Follow up this year to the video of the Scooby Snack sandwiches with me and Emily. So, like last year for Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving, we made a bunch of Scooby Snacks in re- or Scooby sandwiches in real life. I have an even more unhinged video follow up for this year's American Thanksgiving, and it involves a ton of eBay purchases I made recently. So, oh look forward to that, and Emily will be in that as well. But that's my thing. Tristan, hi, t- hello. Hi. Where can people? Pe- I've seen you in real life. Now yeah, for the second time. Times. Three times. Three times. So now my big Four question is, oh my gosh, I've seen you too much, but we're, I want to see you online. Where are you online that I can see you? I have a YouTube channel primarily called Step Back where I try to understand things that are going on in the world by using the past and seeing things in more three dimensions. My most recent video is on AI, which might be my biggest flop in the channel's history, or at least my biggest flop in many years. <laughs> Um, Look at us promoting flops. Yeah, but <laughs> I do have a video. Well, it's kind of tough because the next video I'm making right now is about multiple things that are like, it's about the Rwandan genocide and also why free speech mm. might be bad. So I don't know how I'm going to promote that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Good luck. But yeah, uh, you can find that all at stepbackhistory.com or just nebula.tv slash stepback. Excellent. You can find more of this podcast also over at nebula.tv slash probably not aliens. I know we keep promoting that episodes will be up a week early and they haven't been, but maybe they will now that I'm back, baby. We're both five fans to the gills. Yeah. And thank you to, <laughs> thank you to everyone who writes reviews of this show on Apple Podcasts and answers those questions. People have been, I don't use Spotify, but I keep getting so many emails of people responding to like the Q&A on Spotify. I'm just like, how did you like this episode? And people are doing that so much more now. I need to get a way that I can get access to like all the reviews yeah. and stuff because I need praise. Yeah. I don't get a lot of nice things. Oh, the reviews are public. You can look it up, but you don't nice. have an Apple thing. So anyway, yeah. thank you to everyone who also tells your friends about the show. That's how we grow mm-hmm. as well as our very consistent publishing schedule. That's also how we grow. But in lieu of that, telling your friends, <laughs> super helpful. And a best, the best place to send your friends is a very simple website probsnotaliens.com. Yeah. That's where you send them. It's got links to everything. But that's it. Until next time, 
My name is Scott Nicebonder. I'm Tristan Johnson, and the truth is out there. Probably... How many ways can I say one word is the question. (laughs) We'll never know.